Warrior One, Season Two, Episode One. How are you, Warriors? Welcome back to the next season of the Warrior One Podcast, where we ask the question: How do, how do we best live this one brief magical life? We answer that question with stories, songs, interviews, and warrior wisdom. We are strange and wonderful. True that. And mostly we are very grateful that you are here with us. True that. And by we, I mean me. True that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> My name is Derek Goodwin. And I'm Pashupa Goodwin. And together, and together we're, we're Derek Pashupa, Pashupa Goodwin. Goodwin. <laughs> but my given name is Derek. Pashupa was my given name. Well, well you get oh. names and you, you wear them like socks. You, you get know, a lot you of put names. one on one yeah, foot, you got a one lot on of the socks. other, and your Sometimes identity there's is two this people thing, in your, your head. Identity is that thing, and then maybe three. And you're like, which people one am like, I? What's your real name? I don't know and which I'm like, one I don't on. know. And so, anyway, that's the story of my life. But today, I'm very excited to share a story from my father's life with you. And this is a story about Antarctica, the first naval airstrip and the first naval bases in Antarctica. And believe it or not, that my father was one of the first people from the United States to set foot on the South Pole. Is, is that, that true? true? That's crazy. Which I just found out. That yeah, is crazy. Wow. Well, um, there's also a sea shanty. A sea shanty? A sea shanty. Let me take you back in time over a century ago to a race between two countries, two men, to be the first to set foot on the South Pole. How do we best live this one brief magical life? For some, the answer is adventure. In 1911, two expeditions set out to be the first humans to set foot on the South Pole. One was led by a Norwegian explorer named Roald Amundsen, along with four other men, who reached the Pole on December 14, 1911. They planted a black flag and became the first humans known to set foot on the Earth's southernmost point. The second expedition was led by a British explorer named Robert Falcon Scott, also with a team of five men. Scott's expedition was plagued with bad luck and bad planning. Near their base camp hut at McMurdo Sound, the ponies they had procured for the expedition were separated from them on an ice floe. As the men worked to rescue them, killer whales began circling, their heads rising out of the water to watch the terrified ponies. In the end, the men couldn't rescue the ponies and killed them instead, allowing the whales to eat the unusual meat. It was an omen of things to come. Scott's expedition reached the South Pole on January 17, 1912, only to find Amundsen's flag. It must have been the biggest buzzkill ever. The return journey was hampered by unusually cold weather, and a dog team that was supposed to meet up with them never showed up. In early March, a team member named Captain Lawrence Oates became ravished by frostbite on his feet. Knowing he was slowing the team down, one morning he stepped out of his tent barefoot into a blizzard, famously telling the others, I'm just going outside and maybe some time. His body was never found, but those words live on. Another member of the team died from brain trauma caused by a fall. The remaining three, including Scott, ran out of food and fuel and died of hypothermia in late March of 1912. Their bodies were discovered in November of that year, along with Scott's diary telling their tale. <laughs> This is Antarctica, nearly six million square miles of ice-covered wasteland, larger than the United States and Europe combined. Less than one-third of this great continent has been explored. Its mean elevation is 6,000 feet, but some of its mountain peaks rise above 15,000 feet. It is the highest and coldest continent in the world. In Antarctica, scientists hope to find the answers to many questions, which will unlock secrets of the universe. Secrets of the universe. 
Military videos were so dramatic back in the day. In 1955, 44 years after Robert Scott's fateful journey, my father, William R. Goodwin, as part of U.S. Naval Task Force 43, set sail for Antarctica. The mission was called Operation Deep Freeze, and the goal was to establish naval bases in Antarctica to host scientific research in the upcoming International Geophysical Year. The IGY, as it was known, was a program of geophysical research that was to be conducted from 1957 to 1958. The International Geophysical Year is a combined effort of scientists of more than 60 nations to gain knowledge of the Earth and related phenomena by worldwide simultaneous observation. One of the most extensive of all international geophysical year investigations is taking place in the Antarctic regions with 11 nations participating. And by direction of the President of the United States, Rear Admiral Richard E. Byrd, veteran polar explorer, was named officer in charge. Rear Admiral George Dufek was appointed commander, Task Force 43, with the responsibility to construct bases, operate them, supply and resupply them, and transport scientists to and from Antarctica. Task Force 43 was organized under Commander-in-Chief Atlantic Fleet to implement the operation, which was assigned the code name Operation Deep Freeze. The IGY encompassed research in 11 fields of geophysics, aurora and air glow, cosmic rays, geomagnetism, glaciology, gravity, ionospheric physics, Longitude and latitude determinations, meteorology, oceanography, seismology, and solar activity. The timing of the IGY was chosen to coincide with a maximum sunspot cycle, when solar flares and other disturbances would be prevalent. According to NASA, it was from the IGY rocket and satellite research that the U.S. developed its space program. My father sailed from Rhode Island on a transportation ship called the USS Wyandotte, which carried supplies and sailors from the construction battalion known as Seabees. The first task was to build an airstrip at McMurdo Sound, the same place where Robert Falcon Scott had built a hut and lost his ponies to killer whales. The airstrip would give Navy Task Force 43 a staging platform so that they could establish a base at the South Pole the following summer in time for the IGY. The Wyandotte moored in McMurdo Sound on December 27, 1955, three days before my father's 20th birthday. And now, as promised, another bit of sea shanty. A fleet of ships put out to sea as part of Task Force 43. The hulls were filled with supplies and sea bees headed down to the ice below. Soon will the Wyandotte come, we'll drink our beer and eat our grub. Build an airstrip by Scott's hut in the land of the ice and snow. Antarctica's six million miles of ice with mountain peaks 15,000 feet high Where many a man has gone to die for the thrill of the unknown Soon will the wine not come, we'll drink our beer and eat our grub And build an airstrip ice guts hut in the land of the ice and snow If this music sounds familiar I borrowed the melody from a famous sea shanty called Wellerman, which was written about a whaling ship in New Zealand circa 1860. Coincidentally, New Zealand was the Wyandotte's final stop before Antarctica. Sea shanties blew up on TikTok this year, so you might have heard a version of Wellerman. I wrote new lyrics to go with my father's story, and you will hear all of them by the end of this episode. So be forewarned, matey. The guitar parts are inspired by a YouTube guitar tutorial called Six Levels of Wellerman by Capo X. And of course, I put those through the The Pashupanidoa. Links to all of that in the show notes. But for now, let's get back to the story. Preceding the Wyandotte by 10 days, an icebreaker ship named the Glacier arrived in McMurdo Sound to do some scouting. 
December 18th, the task force sighted the Antarctic continent when Mount Erebus, the only known active volcano in the Antarctic, towering 13,000 feet above McMurdo Sound, came into view. The glacier moored to the ice, and its helicopter flew a survey party ashore to find an area on the bay ice suitable for a long, flat runway that would support the weight of the large planes of the air unit. Commander Abbey and Commander Whitney surveyed an 8,000-foot strip of ice at the south end of McMurdo Sound. They tested its thickness with a gas-powered chainsaw to determine if the ice would support heavy planes without skis. This site was found to be suitable. It was located immediately north of the 1902 expedition camp of Royal Navy Captain Robert Scott, leader of the second party to reach the pole. Food stores left here by the Scott party over a half century ago were found to be perfectly preserved and quite edible. There was grape jelly. I had some of the grape jelly. <laughs> and I, I think it was his crackers. I'm not sure. But anyway, then the historic preservation people came and chased us all away. We never went there again. But several of us had food that was left over. As far as we could tell, it was perfectly good. 50-year-old crackers and jelly preserved in the Earth's freezer and passed down through time. Something about it is fun to run through the processes of my mind. The grape jelly that connected my father to Robert Falcon Scott. The history of crackers in Antarctica. And why didn't anyone bring any peanut butter? I think it would have saved Scott's life. When we got there, and I think probably it was December of 56, no one was there. There was nothing at all there. And we originally slept in tents where the base was going to be. The first thing that was put up, I believe, was the mess hall. So we slept in tents, and our main job for the first few weeks, month maybe, was to ferry supplies from the Wyandot to the base. The ice was too thick to get within, I don't know, five miles of the land. It was simply too thick for the Wyandot or anything else to break. So we'd drive back and forth, um, pick up stuff from the ship, and bring it to the base, because there was absolutely nothing there when we arrived. Well, Scott's hut was there, but it was not habitable. Once we got to the Antarctic, I was a mechanic, um, and my main job was to keep the equipment running. It got so cold in the winter that we had to keep all the equipment running 24 hours a day because starting it was a major undertaking. And since I had been an aviation electrician, I was theoretically at least knowledgeable about, about uh, keeping the batteries fully charged and keeping the generators running. I drove what was called a weasel, which was an amphibious equivalent of a Jeep. It had tracks instead of wheels, and the body of the thing was shaped like a boat, so if it fell into the water, it would theoretically float. Floating theoretically, it's where my mind loves to be. Sometimes I float upon the sea, untethered from the shore. My dad's a mechanic, he drove a weasel, a treaded tractor that ran on diesel. Pulling supplies across a flat and lethal, planes of the vast ice flow. Soon will the wind out come, we'll drink our beer and eat our grub, and we'll build an airstrip by Scott's hut in the land of the ice and snow. They moored the ships in McMurdo Sound to lay the first naval airstrip down, which is where Richard Williams drowned when the crevice pulled his tractor below. Soon will the wind not come, we'll drink our beer and we'll eat our grub. We'll build an airstrip by Scott's hut in the land of the ice and snow. Da 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 
Any song smith worth their salt knows you can't have a sea shanty without some drinking and without some dying. My father's time in Antarctica saw some of each. January 6, 1956. The first U.S. Navy fatality in Antarctica. Richard Williams was driving a D-8 tractor across a wood bridge, spanning a crack in the sea ice, when the ice gave way. Williams was part of my crew, in the same crew that I was in, and once we got a large bulldozer unloaded, the chief said, well, there's a crack there, let's go back in and have coffee, back onto the ship and have coffee and figure out what we're going to do about it. But Williams, on his own initiative, drove the thing, and it crashed through the ice and fell to the bottom of the sea and, of course, killed him, and we lost the tractor. So it was sad that he died, but it was pretty much a disaster for the rest of us to lose it. My father is a pragmatist, and the Antarctic is unforgiving. There would be airplane crashes and more dying to come. But fortunately, my father and most of the crew would return home safely. But what are the drinking, you say? Well, sit back and let William Goodwin tell you the tale. Well, it was pretty um, unwoke, I guess. It was, <laughs> as I remember, it was once a month. We had 100 proof ethanol. In other words, pure ethanol. No, you know, whiskey is, is 50 proof. So anyway, and they would mix it with grape juice. I don't know how the grape, where the grapes came from, but in, in a big punch bowl. And guys would really, really get drunk and they'd dress up like women and everything <laughs> else and dance around. There was only really one rule on those days, and that was that you couldn't leave the hut where the party was without someone with you who wasn't drunk. Uh, because you'd go outside, it was pitch dark. Right. So if you went outside to relieve yourself, it was hard to find the next place even when you were sober. So most of the time I was either the door guard or the guy that had to go with somebody because I couldn't drink that much. It made me sick or <laughs> happy. <laughs> I drank beer. We We had double bunks in our hut where we lived. I think we were maybe given a case a week or some amount. Each person would keep it under the lower bunk. And then you'd say, well, I think I'll have two tonight when I get back. So you would put them on the top bunk and it would thaw enough to drink. It also had some kind of a preservative in it. So right at the bottom was kind of a slimy. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. You had to be. Wasn't a craft microbrewery no, beer? No, it definitely wasn't. <laughs> so that's where I got the line. We'll drink our beer and we'll eat our grub. Well, what was this grub they ate, you ask? I asked my father about that, too. Well, I hate to tell you this, Derek. But, uh, <laughs> You're eating seals? Yes. The, the seals, there were a lot of seals, and we killed them and butchered them and then saved the meat to feed the dogs over the winter. We had a, we had a, a dog team. Uh, that was led by a veteran dog team driver from the Air Force. I guess the Air Force has a, had a base or something in the Arctic. And so he was there with his dogs, or the dogs, and we kept them over the winter, and they ate, ate the seals we killed in the fall, you know, when because the seals were only available when it was open water. So we ate them, or the dogs ate them. I don't think we ate any seal meat, but... You guys had steaks. Well, I don't recall much steak. All I remember <laughs> is tons of uh, powdered eggs and powdered potatoes. Oh, wow. I guess we had other stuff too, surely, that was but the, I don't much remember it. Before the MRE? Yes, had. definitely. I had read in an article about the men eating steaks, which is why I asked my father that question. Turns out it was the scientist who got to eat the steaks. Civilians get the expensive stuff. Now, many of you know that I'm a vegan and might assume I'm offended by the killing of the seals. It happens that I know quite a few vegans who go to great lengths to eat only plants, but will feed their cats and dogs other animals. I can see the utility in feeding the seals to the dogs. I do think that the sailors would have been better off with peanut butter than powdered eggs, though, and vegan pancakes on special occasion. 
Who brought these climate scientists here in 1957 geophysical year? The melting ice is not yet feared. Take comfort in what you don't yet know. Soon will the wine not come. We'll drink our beer and eat our grub. And we'll build an airstrip by Scott's hut in the land of the ice and snow. Da 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 Looking back 60 years, knowing what we know now, I wondered if anyone noticed any signs of global warming back then. Not that I'm aware of, no. I don't, I don't think that entered into it. You know, that was very close to the time when we're people, Americans, were more worried about a nuclear winter due to atomic warfare. And I don't, I don't think anybody considered something like global warming. There's still a station at the South Pole itself. It's been there all this time. I think it's, I think they even have a nuclear reactor there. But scientists go down there every, every year. It's, it's continually staffed. So they're undoubtedly studying things like maybe the ozone hole or other effects worldwide that are noticeable there. An article in the August 1956 National Geographic by Admiral Byrd, sensationally titled, An All-Out Assault on Antarctica gave a little hint of the effects of the Earth's warming. The head of the science team at the time was a man named Paul Seipel, and Bird wrote, At the head of the majestic Beardmore Glacier, we found the mountains bare over broad areas, and from the upper Beardmore, blue ponds, completely ice-free, winked up at us. Many of the bowl-like mountain cirques were empty of ice. Paul Seipel agreed with me that these features gave evidence of slight glacial withdrawal, or at least snow starvation, in this area. Certainly glaciers here once had greater extent. The climate effects of our all-out assault on the Earth are now well known by most, even if not believed by all. The National Geographic from the following year, July of 1957, featured an article by Paul Seipel now an active participant in the International Geophysical Year. The article had a less dramatic name. We are living at the South Pole. Seipel posed an interesting thought experiment in a section of the article called Ice Would Raise Oceans 40 Feet. Many explorers and scientists have guessed at the depth of the ice beneath us. Estimates range far and deep. If the average guess is correct, the polar ice cap, if melted, would raise the levels of the sea by 40 feet, sufficient to require gondolas in the streets of London and to leave tourists stranded on the steps of the Lincoln Memorial in Washington, D.C. Seipel's soft apocalyptic vision of the future might be coming sooner than we think, according to an article in the April 2021 Harvard Gazette. Global sea level rise associated with the possible collapse of West Antarctica ice sheet has been significantly underestimated in previous studies, meaning the sea level and warming world will be greater than anticipated, according to a new study from Harvard researchers. The report features new calculations for what researchers refer to as water expulsion mechanism. This occurs when the solid bedrock the West Antarctic ice sheet sits on rebounds upward as the ice melts, and the total weight of the ice sheet decreases. The bedrock sits below sea level, so when it lifts, it pushes water from the surrounding area into the ocean, adding to global sea level rise. The magnitude of the effect shocked us, said Linda Pan, a PhD student in Earth and Planetary Science in GSAS who co-led the study with fellow graduate student Evelyn Powell. If the West Antarctic ice sheet collapsed, the most widely cited estimate of the resulting global mean sea level rise that would result is 3.2 meters, said Powell. What we've shown is that the water expulsion mechanism will add an additional meter, or 30%, to that total. Sea level rise doesn't stop when the ice stops melting, Pan said. The damage we are doing to our coastline will continue for centuries. An article in NASA's website titled, Antarctica melts under its hottest days on record, 
gives us a glimpse of recent events. The February heat wave was the third major melt event of the 2019 to 2020 summer, following warm spells in November 2019 and January 2020. If you think about this one event in February, it isn't that significant, said Maury Pelto, a glaciologist. It's more significant that these events are coming more frequently. Summer sun never sets, winter sun never rises. We do our work before the dark. The ships will leave and the freeze will come and we'll spend the winter below. Early on, when we were trying to get all the equipment off the ship and onto the shore, we did work pretty much around the clock because nobody knew when a storm might come or the sea become too rough because it would have just been too difficult to offload stuff. We didn't have cranes and things. So people did work around the clock and pretty much, and the cooks and people had to keep working and the people that had to gather up, scoop up snow to melt for water had to pretty much keep going all the time. It took a while to unload stuff off the ship onto sleds that we would then pull back to the base and at that time we go people like me would go and get on the ship and either take a bath or go to sleep or whatever and then at the other end we couldn't sleep because we had to get the stuff off the sled so they could get back to the ships and um, it had to be stacked because we knew it would be covered with snow and would be hard to find so we tried to have some regularity of Placement. By the March equinox of 56, the airstrip was up at McMurdo Sound and supplies were left there for the phase two of Operation Deep Freeze in six months when light returned to the continent. The Wyandotte and other ships left with most of the men, leaving my father and the wintering over crew behind. Light returned to the continent in the September equinox and phase two began. On Halloween Day 1956, an airplane with skis named K. Sada Sada landed at the South Pole with Admiral Dufek and six other men. They became the first humans since Robert Scott's team to set foot on the pole. They had frostbite forming on their faces within minutes, and they quickly got the hell out of there. My father and the other Seabees were at the pole soon after, setting up prefabricated structures that could shelter them from the unrelenting cold. And so my father indeed was one of the first people from the United States and the world to step on the South Pole. And it was freaking cold. I think it was minus 73, for some reason sticks in my head. There was a Russian base established somewhere nearby. We couldn't see it, but in radio contact, and we we sort of kept in touch with them about the temperature. And they got down to minus 100, but we got down to minus 73. No portion of the Antarctic was officially belonged to any country. So every country possibly could do so, establish some sort of a presence on the island. Uh, Russia had a base, Brazil had a base, and I don't know who else, but no doubt others. And we did communicate by radio, but the Russians had women at their base, and so talking to them... (laughs) <laughs> it was a great goal of the radio people. <laughs> they kept the huts, the places where we lived were called huts, and they were kept at a mean temperature of 40. So you <clears throat> more or less become acclimatized to a much lower temperature. And I don't know that you could tell the difference between, say, minus 20 and minus 50 or something. It was so cold, <laughs> it, couldn't, it was, you know, just too cold to really do anything, or feel or anything. Most of us had beards and mustaches, and the, your breath would freeze on those and you, that, and you could hear that cracking, plus you had to sort of pick at it to keep <laughs> airway. 
uh, for the most part, we didn't stay outside exposed for any great length of time at those extremely low temperatures. And the cabs of the vehicles were heated enough so that it wasn't that bad. But very often at those extremely low temperatures, it was also extremely windy. It was very unpleasant. Living in the eternal sunlight of the spotless ice must have been an almost psychedelic experience. Some of the men struggled with insomnia and started the Big Eye Club, where they would drink coffee and watch movies. Upon my father's return to civilization, the April 4th, 1957 Louisville Courier Journal featured a story about my father's adventure. He reported that the Big Eye's Club name derived from a frequent complaint by a man who later had a nervous breakdown, who said, I've got insomnia with a big eye. I like the image of people walking around with giant eyes, hallucinating as the sun refracts off the snow. My most vivid memory is landing at the South Pole. There was nothing there, absolutely nothing. And of course, there's no, there's no horizon, there are no mountains, there's nothing. And my job there was to drive a D2 tractor and airplanes would fly over and parachute down the equipment we needed. And my job was to drive the tractor out, hook onto that equipment, and bring it back to where the base was actually going to be built. And um, it was, in a way, kind of scary because there were no landmarks. I had to follow my tracks out and follow them back once I got too far to see. And it was, it was quite, there. The sky was, as I remember, almost always blue, all over a couple of windstorms. It's very hard to orient yourself. The sun didn't move, so there's no day, no night, no morning, and no mountain or anything else. So you couldn't say, oh, yeah, that was on my left going out, so it ought to be on my right. Parachute dropping isn't that accurate, so I covered quite a bit of, quite a bit of territory in the month or so I was there pulling stuff in. Much of the time there was either wind or, um, but there were some beautiful blue days when the sun never set, which is a mixed blessing because if, you're, if you want to sleep, it's uh, difficult. As you will hear me sing in the last verse, adventures make for friendships long. At its heart, this is a coming of age story. And on the opposite end, a story of outliving old friends. And perhaps the sweetest part, that even great adventure is eclipsed by finding love and creating a family. How do we best live this one brief, magical life? It was a great adventure. It was great fun. It was like a great Boy Scout uh, camping trip because you you really were dependent on everybody else and everything that you had or brought with you. Before that, I'd been on an aircraft carrier for a couple of years. And really, it's much the same. Um, You're all crowded in together. You've got to pitch in and do your part or the whole whole thing won't work. If the the cooks don't have the meals ready, then (laughs) the mechanics won't fix the airplanes and so on. This was much longer. And, of course, being dark all that time and being cold made it more, for me, when I was a young kid, more exciting. Now it would be. (laughs) <laughs> Not so much fun. But, and it was a great adventure, uh, sort of a coming of age thing when people depended on me to fix a generator or whatever. And, you know, if something happened, someone else probably could have, but then they'd have had to, somebody else would have had to do what their job was. So it, it was exciting and in that sense, but um, I, I don't think anyone noticed any difference when I got back. We had reunions for a while. Um, every, I think every five years, but that stopped, I don't know, 20 years ago. Everyone that I considered a friend was, is dead. My best friend probably was a guy named Clay and he died. And, and so there probably are others alive, but I don't know who they are and I haven't kept in touch. It was a great adventure. If you're going to be in the military, and have an adventure. <laughs> it's very nice to have one that doesn't involve getting shot at or anything. In retrospect, it was fun. So it was a great event in my life. I don't want to say the greatest. I mean, marriage and children and things 
would dwarf it now, but having me was the best. Yeah, well, that was <laughs> certainly um, that was the biggest adventure. <laughs> but you know, it, it, it was. It's a it's a great thing to look back on, and uh, it's always strange to me when veterans say how much they've sacrificed. Actually, I feel like I ought to chip in something to the other vets because I've sort of <laughs> got a, a free ride. To sing the moral of this song Adventures make for friendships long The courage in our heart is just as strong As the winds of the sun and power Soon will the way not come We'll drink our beer and we'll eat our grub We'll build an airstrip by Scott's hut In the land of the ice and snow Soon will the wine not come, we'll drink our beer and we'll eat our grub. Build an airstrip by Scott's hut in the land of the ice and snow. Thanks for listening, warriors. If you want to hear the uninterrupted version of The Wyandotte Comes, head over to our Audius channel. Audius is a platform like Spotify, but it is free for listeners and uses blockchain tokens to reward artists and creators. Eventually, you will be able to hear all of our original songs on this platform. Links to Audius and everything else we talked about are in our show notes at warrioronepodcast.com. As I finished editing the show, I tested positive for COVID. So far, I'm okay, just a headache and some fever chills. I've tried to stay away from COVID debates. For the record, I've had two shots of the J&J, and perhaps the mild symptoms are a testament to that. I don't believe the vaccine should be given to children, and for anyone else, it should be a personal choice. The government and pharmaceutical companies have a history of lying and bad ethics, and giving up our freedom to mandates and vaccine passports is a very slippery slope. So is censorship, of course. If you can't convince people by putting out good ideas, then you should work on your messaging. What we need is love. The earth is in crisis with climate change, factory farming, the rise of totalitarianism, and so much more. Social media makes it easy to argue and hate one another, but that's not going to solve anything. We need to build bridges, and that's the message of this podcast. Living our one brief magical life comes with the realization that we are all interconnected. I'm working on plans to monetize the show with sponsorships and memberships. But for now, I just want to put it out there for you to enjoy. Happy New Year, be safe, and we'll be back soon.